it's it's great to be back on uh, on um, the UK North. It's great to have UK North back in the north of England. Always lots of fun. Um, every, the last few times I've spoken at UK North, it's been on um, network automation topics where I've really been talking about um, things that I've found interesting with regards to uh, instructing a network to do something in a programmatic manner. And after doing three or four of these projects, um, I then had the opportunity to do a completely greenfield, a greenfield uh, network automation uh, project um, where we could actually start with a, with a fully automated uh, set of business processes that were tied to the, the network product. And this is up and running and it's live and I thought I'd, um, I'd talk about some of the things that I had to do um, with a network background for the first time with regards to building um, automation that touched the rest of the business. And in order to, to do that successfully, we had to um, build something called a, a data model. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about what that is, why we did that, and the benefits I got from that as a network operator. Um, let's... Okay, no problem. So uh, essentially, when you start a network automation project, or we as network operators, um, we'll, we'll, we'll start by having a, a network that's in service, some customers that are using it, and, um, and we want to do things in a better way. So we'll start to, to automate. And what that means, typically, for operators at the beginning, is we will have um, some reports that we want to build from the network. The clicker isn't working. Well, here we go. Um, we'll start by um, by automating the network by having um, some some reports that come from the network, and we will um, use those to to inform uh, the customers or the knock the state of things that are happening on the network. Something is wrong. Something is broken. Something is good. Something is working. Um, after that we'll start to build tools that help us do repetitive, boring jobs, but still sit in isolation. So essentially, maybe building peering sessions with, um, with, with other networks. We'll have a tool that goes and does the boring things of setting that up over and over and over again. After that, once we have a tool, we'll start to build more comprehensive applications that may help us make decisions as well as to instruct the network. After that, we start to build and uh, a business where the, the business process and the network processes are uh, integrated and we have a fully automated business. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this this tends to be something that businesses with, with scale achieve. You start out with simple tools and you build them to a comprehensive suite of applications that integrate completely with your customer requirements. And it's, it's, about, it's about this that I'm talking about. So this presentation gives um, a few technical perspectives and thoughts on the architecture for the Greenfield project that we've just done at Asteroid. What motivated us to actually do this? Well, really, it was the fact that we had to do a lot of things at the same time over and over again. There was a lot of re repetition in our, in our product. We build internet exchange points for others. We do the same thing every time, and we don't want to have to do anything by hand every time that we do it. Um, also, having a fully automated business process and technical process that work together means that we have um, a large amount of efficiency and leanness that can um, offer cheaper pricing, for example, to customers. Um, it helps us have a high degree of service assurance if we do provisioning in a very, very rapid manner and we can monitor um, services and monitor the availability and, and uh, monitor um, the assurance that the service is working. Uh, then we can hopefully provide a better service to our customers. We can integrate with third-party networks if we get this right, um, such, such as the ROIX database, the PeeringDB database, and our customers' networks who want to further automate themselves. And, and also, because we were traditionally quite frustrated with the with with a, with a um, traditional model, which involves pa paper being passed around between teams and slow provisioning and and less good service assurance. So I'm going to talk about what a data model is, how to build it, and also some software architecture for more mature automated network projects, and also software testing, which is something that I, um, I believe in. Now, I've said data model a few times. What do I actually mean by data model when I, talk, when I say that? And I'm defining it as a, a description of the things that your business needs to know in order to operate. 
And if you, well, when you, when you want to have an automated business process that works with your automated network, it's important to to design or to map the steady state of your business. What does your business need to know in order to operate? You know, who are um, my org customers? Who, which organisations are my customers? Who works for them? Who can um, cause a ticket to be created on behalf of that customer? What products do they buy? How are those products configured? This steady state, you need to map out um, a description of the steady state of all of these things in your business. And then model and map out the interactions between those, uh, those things. So, um, for example, organisations buy products by having a quote which is requested by people. You can model how those um, elements of the service fit together and then the interactions between those services can also be modelled as well through uh, quotes and uh, configuration steps and, and change requests and all of these things that your business knows whenever the steady state is changing. Now, why should you even care about that from an engineering point of view? Is, is, it, is it interesting to us as network operators? And I would argue absolutely yes. One of the first things I realised when we actually modelled um, quotes and started putting them into, the, into our tools that we could see and use in engineering is I could actually set up things like monitoring using the quotes. I could monitor what we'd agreed and contracted to sell the customer, not what I had rolled out as an engineer. And that means that I can do service assurance based on what the customer described they wanted to buy, not what it is that I've turned around and delivered. Um, so I think it, it is something that's useful and interesting from an engineering point of view, and something that is worth getting right um, as, as engineering decision makers in a business. Now, once you've modeled that data, what it is that I need to know before I can uh, operate as a business, when I've, when I've got that modeled, you ask, where does that data live? And if the business has been operating for any period of time, you'll find that that data lives in lots of different places. Your finance team will have a lot of this information in their own systems or some spreadsheets. Um, your sales department might have a CRM that the, sales team don't, the finance team don't use. You're in engineering, you'll have a set of databases. In support, you might have a different set of databases, this kind of thing. And the data, although you can model what it is that I need to know, I need to know who my customer, customers are, what they're buying, how that's configured, you might find that information is spread out in quite a few different places. And actually, it's fine for that data to be spread out and live in different places. But what isn't fine is if on that data not being the same in all of those places. So, for example, if your finance team know one customer, the same customer as Search Engine Netherlands, and your sales team know them as Search Engine Inc., and your support database just knows them as Search Engine, and engineering, well, we just deal with Fred, that's actually a problem. It's, it's not fine for data to be, to be in more than one place and for all of those places to be authoritative for any single type of record. The way to deal with that is to work out which database is going to be authoritative for that kind of information on your network and for all of your other tools and databases to use that um, single place. So if you're going to use um, third-party CRMs, third-party accounting systems, you need to be very, very careful to make sure that it has an API that you can plug into so that it can be authoritative. The f it's fine for the finance database to be authoritative for organisation names, for example, as long as you can get that out and use it in your engineering scripts as well. So you need to model the data, describe what data you need to know, and then store that piece of data once to ensure that it's correct. What I mean by that is, if the information is wrong, you can update it in one place and then the rest of your business takes advantage of that update. You, you store the information in one place, you keep it right in one place, and the rest of your business has got access to the correct data that it can use in lots of places. Give every record a unique ID, which has nothing to do with the record itself, because information about customers can change. Don't use an AS number as the key, as the identifier for a customer, because the customer could change AS number, could get bought, could get sold, could build a new network, a set another product. Decide where, which, which database, which tool, where is it going to be authoritative? And this, of course, means it needs buy-in and planning from across the business. So although typically your network automation projects to date might 
just live inside engineering and just and provide advantages to the rest of the business, actually it needs buy-in support from decision makers across the business for this to be a success to actually do a mature automation project. When you're designing your data model, one important thing that you need to remember to do is to separate information that's about your customer and information that's about your own infrastructure. It might be very tempting to put all of the information about a service that's configured on a port in the same table as the port, for example. But it's very important to separate infra infrastructure data, stuff that you own and control, and the service information, stuff that you do on behalf of a customer in that, uh, in that database. It makes your data much, much more portable and means that as you start to roll out additional kinds of services, um, you have a greater de degree of flexibility. You can, you can have two services that don't look a, a great deal like each other um, on, a, on a port that's always the same because it's always the same kind of port, for example. Uh, there are a number of um, fashions to consider as you, as you consider a database. If you're going to have a database in engineering, and I recommend that you do, um, there are a number of fashions that uh, you'll start to read about and have to consider um, what type of database will we use. Typically, um, uh, one that um, if, you, if you have development teams in your engineering function, you'll have to decide are we going to use a traditional relational database or a, or a document store database. Um, developers like document stores because they're extremely extensible and less um, strict. If you need to use a, um, if you need to use an additional um, field at, at some point for a new service, you can just start using that in your document. Um, but I've, I've, I've tried both models. I've had different um, application suites, some built on document stores, some built on relational databases, and I've found that the, the traditional um, strict database function is, for engineering style data is definitely a, a feature rather than um, a, a constraint. Um, your, your network infrastructure, um, when you're configuring it to a template, it's, it's definitely a feature for that to be uh, s set up with a relational database um, system that, that needs more careful planning to, in order to extend and change because ultimately you're configuring um, devices that, that have um, really, really, really rather strict uh, configuration mechanisms anyway. So I've tried both document store and relational database and I've found that relational databases uh, yield much better results because they are inherently um, easier to store the data once in one place and keep that up to date. Um, common data stores, I use um, all of these uh, data stores in um, at the Asteroid um, backend. Um, so I, I thought I'd mention them. We, we use um, a traditional relational database to store uh, truths about <coughs> users, ports, services, and configuration state on the network. So we use uh, MySQL to store information about who our customers are, uh, what, they've, what we've quoted them, what they've bought from us, uh, how that's rolled out, where that's rolled out. Um, but I also use time series databases. So I use InfluxDB um, to store time series data, such as um, uh, traffic use of, of a port, uh, light levels from optics, uh, error counts from ports. Um, InfluxDB is working well for that. And I use a lot of third-party databases, so a CRM that might store information about what people, what you've quoted for people, um, but also things like the peering DB database. Um, so instead of um, trying to replicate the amount of information that there is about data centers, just using that third party database, which is kept up to date by people who are engaged. The um, Euro IX or IX, um, IXF database information about um, what people are doing with public peering, that's updated by third parties all of the time. And you can use that in your own systems to, to keep your own data um, fresh and up-to-date, um, and it's all in a, in a structured format. So um, we use these kinds of data stores all the time, and I, I recommend that these, these ones work, and I recommend you investigate them for your own projects. Um, so what would the general architecture look like? When you've built your data model, um, you've built some, uh, some tools that use that data model to keep it up-to-date, what does the general architecture look like um, when it's more mature? And um, this is what our architecture looks like, if it's interesting. Um, 
In the middle, we have an API, which I'll talk about in more detail. That's homegrown. That it's a, it's a um, Flask application that can interrogate all of our backend systems. So we use um, CRMs, we use MySQL, we use InfluxDB, third-party databases. And we can also talk to um, worker scripts that go and get information or put information on the individual devices, such as uh, the switches that we use at internet exchange points, um, route servers, collectors. Um, so we use um, a single API layer that can talk to any number of backends that, that operate as, as modules. I recommend that architecture because it's, it's very, very flexible and we can change out and test different backend systems with great ease without changing very much in the middle uh, or changing anything at our client utility level. Uh, so we have um, multiple portals, management portals, customer management portals and a customer web interface as, as well as scripts and as well as customers that have built their own uh, utilities that integrate with our API. This architecture um, allows us very simply in, in very, very simple scripts to maintain quite complicated business processes that, um, uh, through a single API. Um, yes, it makes it very easy to expose your tools and data to customers, and this is a, this is a very, very good thing. I think that uh, one of the fashions in networks engineering that I'm most excited about and most happy about is the fact that ISPs and networks carriers are sharing more information about what they see on their network with their customers, um, which reduces uh, time to, to fix when there are failures and, um, and, and helps customers get more from their products. Um, yes, and having a single API layer means that it, it simply doesn't matter what the back-end um, st storage system is. If you just pick a single um, export format for your API layer, and whatever, if you happen to use a finance system that can only talk XML and um, database systems that, that don't expose JSON, whatever at all, you can, you can harmonize that to a single format to your customer so they just have to engage with you in one way. And, and to your other scripts, so you can only you only have to understand one format in your scripts and uh, your, your portal development. Here's an example of uh, what some of our um, internal API looks like when we're talking to customers. So customers can get this data, and um, through two simple API calls. So the one on the left is a is a service call. So the a customer can get their information that we hold in the database about who they are. Um, they can see the information from the collector, they can see some information from root server, they can see some information from the switch, and on the right, they, this is what a, a, a port object looks like. The customer can see what we're holding in the engineering database about them, they can see some information that's coming from the switch, they can see some information that's coming from InfluxDB from the same call, and that's the advantage that a single API layer can do. The customer can go and get if, if information in a single call about a family of, of stuff that's all working together well. So you built your data model. You've got your, what can you do with it in engineering? Why, why is it so exciting for engineers? You've built your data model. You built an API so that you can interface with that data model in a single format. You can talk some uh, HTTP at, a, at an endpoint and back will come some JSON that you can interpret and use. Why is that exciting at all? Well, once you've got confidence in your data model, once you're spending more time using that data rather than importing and fixing that data, you can then harness the power of templated configuration. Um, and when the data model extends across the business into finance, into sales, you can do that with a much greater degree of accuracy and devolve control. So for example, um, at Asteroid, um, our salespeople can deliver exchange ports directly from our internal, um, internal system based on the quotation, because what hap how do you put a port live? Well, from a business point of view, a customer has accepted the quote. That's the, that's the thing that starts the process of putting a port live, so why not deliver the port from that page, and why not have salespeople do that automatically? Uh, and, that's what, and customers can do that. Once we've built that automation, we put that process into the portal, so if a customer is happy with a quote, the customer can click accept, and it delivers the, the port. And as well as delivering the port, we can deliver a, a greater variety of services and back-end and hidden services uh, to customers as well because the thing that dispatches the, the, the thing that goes and configures the port and creates the demarcation can also go and set up a bunch of monitoring for service assurance as well. That's the advantage. So 
I, I call it the automation fire triangle because I think there's three things that work together and the more, the, the, the more stuff you have in these areas, the more automated your business processes and ultimately business can become. The more information you store in a structured format about your business, the more um, uh, that structured data is available to your software via the API, and the, the, the richer or more rich your templates are, the more automatic your business processes are, the more that you can do with software rather than with uh, manual processes. The templating engine that I use, I, I tried a few, uh, the one that I was happiest with is one called Ginger. Uh, it, I use it to generate all kinds of configuration that, uh, that, that have a, a text structure. Um, it takes fields from my JSON API, so I can store the information in uh, CRM databases, in our engineering SQL database, it can be in the um, uh, time series database, it can be in the finance database, it can be anywhere, but I'm calling it from one place via the single API, and, it, and because all that information is available in the API, I can put those variables into the Ginger templates, and the template facilitates simple programmatic um, uh, methods inside the config. So I, I can do loops and conditionals inside the templates. And this is, exam for example, how we build the, what does this do? It builds the collector BGP sessions in our bird system. So you can see the bits that inside the two curly braces are the bits that I'm getting from our API that could be sitting in any database in the back end inside our, our uh, structured data model. And for rolling it out, so it, I've got these, these templates that describe um, what I want config to look like. For rolling it out, um, I've, I, um, I looked at do we have um, scripts and, and stuff in, in Cron. Actually, I found that um, using Ansible was a great way of managing the actual configuration rollout mechanism because it's, it actually looks like co uh, config rather than code. It's very, very easy to understand. Again, it's, it's, um, it's simply structured. And, this is something, oh, this installs the config that you've just seen. Um, so it, um, it, it, the, you can see the first line is to go and get a bunch of stuff from our API in a structured format, uh, then loop over the template, and then um, that actually will go and roll it out as well. Uh, that, that bit of config, uh, there's no scripts, it's just a set of config. Um, yes, you can do conditional logic without uh, writing a script. So traditionally, people have said, well, I need to write a script that, that, that can do my role. Actually, with Ansible, you can see here, what does this do? This, when, connection this route, oh, I see. So this is the a similar bit of Ansible config that will go and roll out um, root server sessions rather than collector sessions. Everybody gets a collector session, but only people that have opted into the root server get um, root server sessions, and this, the line that starts when on this config example here, is how to do the if root server flag is yes, then give the, um, the root server config. Uh, without, a, without any code, it's just, it's just config rather than code. So what's the advantages of, um, of, of doing the um, architecture in this way, you know, a single API layer to a number of backends? Well, it means that the API layer can be pretty lightweight. Um, the API layer really is doing nothing but retrieving and updating database records of different kinds of backend databases. And it means that um, a single lightweight layer that you can write in a familiar language that you're comfortable with. I chose Python because I like Flask. Flask uh, is a way of doing um, HTTP APIs where all the hard work's been done for you. Um, and the automation layer um, can be very, very lightweight. It's just a set of config files rather than a family of um, a, a, a suite of software. Um, ensure your API choices allow you to store and retrieve business logic as well. Yes, um, as well as uh, storing um, engineering information, which switches have we bought, where have we deployed them, what ports are configured on them, with what optics, we, we also would store all of our business logic that doesn't actually touch the um, technology layer at all in the, in, in the database as well. So for example, we have um, in our data model something called our campaigns. These are, these are ways of describing where organizations have described to us they would like to see us build an exchange point at some point. Having that data in a structured format as well means that when we, if, if one of those cities we see that there's enough support for us to go and build an IX in that city, we have all that data in the structured format that we can feed in to the, the other 
the other systems as well. Um, it's, and, and it also means that our, um, we, we can have that information appear in customer portals um, with great ease alongside the services that we roll out on the rest of the network. It's very important to figure out what bits of, of um, information do you store that doesn't necessarily lead to you rolling something out on the network um, and, um, and, and that you can store that as well. I haven't spoken about worker architecture. I've talked a lot about touching and rolling out config before. Um, the API also talks to our worker architecture, which is a bit that sits in front of our switches and collectors and stuff where the services actually get rolled out to customers. You need to consider the API, uh, how the API is going to handle uh, the job and network state. If you're rolling out network changes that cause a, um, a change here and here, what happens if the change only happens at one side? Um, how are you going to manage that state, handle that exception, report that to your engineers for investigation? Um, it's important to consider a, a worker layer that's device independent and allows you to do things like device swap outs. Here, I simply decided to put another API um, in front of our devices, um, our Arista switches, our white box switches, our um, Unix servers that, that where Bird lives. Um, I, d I just uh, I put another API layer in front of them that can dispatch jobs into into um, those. It allows me to have a, an Arista module, uh, a white box switch module, uh, a bird module for managing configs. It works pretty well. There's, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You could have um, a, a Rabbit MQ, for example, a, a message message queue system. That's a, a good system because it allow it's got great support in scripting languages. It's fault tolerant. Um, but I, I decided to, do, to use web services so that I could have the same technology stack as our central API. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, really matter. I, oh, yeah, I chose to write a different worker per backend technology. It means that there's a bit of a um, copy-paste code going on between, because we use Napalm for, for rolling out software on um, Arista and a bit of Napalm, a bit of Homebrew for rolling out onto Cumulus stuff. It means there's a bit of copy-paste code, which is something that normally that should ring alarm bells. You shouldn't be copying and pasting code because then you've got two things you need to update in the same way. Um, but to be honest, it meant that I could uh, treat different uh, vendors completely generically um, and, and support the full suite without having to make any compromises on, on what we did. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about software testing before we go for questions, which is something that um, I learned uh, a couple of roles ago, um, and I learned that it saved the day. Um, the way I'm, I'm not really a developer. I come from a, um, a network engineering background, a Linux admin background, and essentially, uh, when you when you start to discover that you're writing a lot of software every day, it's a really good idea to start getting used to writing tests before you actually write the feature. Um, so you write the test first using something like PyTest. You run the test. It doesn't work because you haven't written the feature yet. You then write the feature, and the first time the test goes green, it means you've written the feature based on what you imagined when you first wrote the test. Um, it's, so you'll, you'll read a lot about unit tests where people say, well, you, sh you can mock the data that passes through your processes, but I found that um, I didn't get as good... Um, I, I wasn't trapping, perhaps because I'm not a proper developer, uh, I wasn't trapping the sorts of error conditions that were going to crop up and, and trip me up um, with um, mocked data, whereas if I actually tested the feature I was writing by putting um, uh, you know, data that I could generate with a, um, a module like Python's Faker module into the database for real on my laptop, on my development instance, then actually I, I can... I, I could actually trap more error conditions, trap more broken behavior. So here's an example on the slide um, where you can see that I am checking that I can view my own contacts, not view um, records that I shouldn't be entitled to. Um, I, anyone that's interested in this, I'm, I'm a little bit out of time. Um, so, but if you want to talk about software testing that I've done from a, uh, from a point of view of building network engineering features, I'm happy to talk about that because uh, it's saved me a lot. But that's the end of, of the presentation. Um, I'll leave uh, uh, time for questions, I think, is the time for questions? Yeah, if there's anybody with questions, I'd be very happy to uh, answer them, if I know the answer. Neil.
the lag in here is terrible. Um, Andy, I wonder if you used any, did you use a modeling language um, in the kind of the, the early part of what you were doing? Uh, no. I, I, uh, so things, things like YAML and... Tosca or something like that? Yeah, I, uh, I didn't. I, I've, I decided that um, I started modeling this from a, from a product point of view um, and I found it easier to do um, without a modeling language in, in our case. I know that the, so the advantages of using modeling language is a bunch of uh, systems that can roll stuff out and a load, of com a load of software that already exists if you can model using um, uh, YAML structures that have already been written by other people. But I found that um, I was, I did, actually, I did look at them at the start, but I found that I'd have to shoehorn and compromise um, some of the architecture and product decisions that we wanted to make as an IXP using um, modeling languages that uh, perhaps be more suited to carrier networks and that kind of thing. So I decided to, to, um, to, to actually model it in, all in a relational database um, from scratch when, when, I had a, when I had a quick look. But it, it, that allowed me to get running quicker, I found. But I, I know that, um, for example, um, BT has done quite a lot of work in the past describing network assets and products and services uh, in, in YAML. And it's a good piece of work that I think will be of benefit to similar organizations. I think Neil's got another. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, actually, I was surprised that you can't do it in, in, in YAML, but um, I need to think about it a bit more. But the, I think the challenge, so we've gone through many ways of trying to um, make this kind of future-proof inverted commas, um, and and they all fail unless we start with something that's modelable, um, and 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 actually now no one's allowed to do anything in BT unless they start with a use case that builds a model. Yeah. Um, and and it just j just takes pain away from so many things, and you know the, the network guys going, oh, we can do it all in Yang, we, and that in Yang's great, <coughs> but it doesn't talk to billing systems. Yeah. You know, and and. It's that other aspect of it when you get other IT complexity and holy shit, do we have complexity in IT and BT? Um, yeah. You know, you, you just, you just um, it, it, unless you've done it at that front end, um, we just found it impossible then to, to phase things through. And, and as our business has changed, like we're merging teams and departments, actually some of the work we've done on that has made it really easy to do that because we're not able, you know, we're not having to integrate huge stacks of IT yeah. Because um, we've already got the, the, the model um, and, and we can overlay the product or the customer journeys into that model. Yes. One of the reasons that we t decided to model everything at the beginning is to try and fight off the, the ocean of complexity that um, wants to wash over every business as it grows and scales. And by, uh, by making sure that every idea we have fits our model, it means that we can carry on um, or, or that our model can fit every good idea, <laughs> um, is that as we scale as a business, we hopefully won't add um, cost associated with that complexity whilst not being incapable of adding features that enable customers uh, to use features, um, if that makes any sense at all. It, hmm. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. Are there any more questions? I can't quite see if anyone might have their hand up. Yes, Rob. Hello. Um, that was really interesting. Um, Asteroid is kind of a blank slate. You've, you've been quite lucky in that you've yeah. started from square one and you haven't had to consider a whole bunch of legacy data and how, um, how did you sort of, uh, maybe this is two questions, but how, how did you sort of um, map out what the people are going to do? And so if I change field A in my authoritative finance thing over here, do people understand the consequences of changing that field for something else? So we have certain fields that, from a finance point of view, it doesn't matter. It's just a customer name or some other number. But if I make that data authoritative for that, you know, for that particular field, oh, someone's gone in and changed it. But that then means something else somewhere is going to that was relying on that field. Is it? You don't have. What I'm trying to say is, if you took on a new person now coming into the company, would they understand the consequences of changing all of that data in, the, in those fields in different places? That's a really good question, uh, an interesting question. And um, if 
I think it, it um, in, increases the value of, uh, of changing that data because the only reason to change a piece of information in the finance system or a database somewhere is because the data's wrong. And if something else, somewhere else on the network, somewhere else in my automation, so anything else is depending on a piece of data that's wrong, then I want it to break. I want it to break in a predictable way. I want it to break in a way that I monitor, I want an alarm to come on, and I want to fix the thing that's broken. But if somebody can't change a piece of information that's wrong without something breaking to do with a, a, a script rollout or a port, then it deserves to break and be fixed, <laughs> basically. The, um, and um, make, making sure that um, if somebody changes a company name because a company name needs to be updated and something breaks, that's, that's really, really bad uh, because um, a, comp a name change shouldn't break out, break something on the network or, or break, uh, you know, invoicing or whatever. And yet there's a, there's a family of permissions. It needs to make sure that when people are making changes, um, they've got the permissions to do that. Be they're competent, they understand. You're right, somebody needs to understand the consequences. But, but changing something that's wrong to something that's correct shouldn't cause breakage, the opposite, in fact. So I'd, I'd, I'd encourage people to come in and change things as long as they were changing them to the correct. And how well do you think this is going to cope with when you actually change a business process for whatever reason, we go, oh, we need to, ch we need to change the way that we do this, or um, for some whatever legal reason we have to change it, do you think it's going to cope, you're going to be able to adapt it? Or? I do, um, be because we, although we've only been around a year, there have been um, things like changes in, in the law, I don't want to say those four letters, um, but the, the ways that you store, I mean, we don't store personal, personally, uh, personal information, but we've certainly thought about it and it's caused us to, to think about um, how we store information about uh, our you know, customers' um, data. So, and having automated processes, automated business processes and structured data means that when you change the software, the, the, the change in the policy, the change in the process is enforced. So. You know, if, if we want to change the process by which we roll out, a cust uh, roll out a customer port, that involves changing some software, but that software enforces the policy. So it's, it's fine to change process for something that makes sense because we've actually got software driving the stuff. Um, so we, we have made changes and that's just involved changing some, changing some software and helping people. Often we've changed the process without having to change the user interface and the people haven't become aware that a technical process on the back end has changed. That's another thing that having um, a highly automated software processes means. It means you might um, create a more efficient or a more re regulatory compliant process without actually changing the user interface, without changing what people know is happening. And, and that's another benefit that, that can come about because if, if you have to store a piece of information or you're not allowed to store a piece of information anymore or you want to change um, configuration dialect, you're going to roll it out on a different switch family, whatever. If you're just having software do that, the, then the, the agent, the operator, might not even need to know the process is different. So I think that having structured data that's modelled and strict automation that's, that's rolling out strict processes is a great way of, of doing that with a minimum of, of drama or stress for people. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay, that's all the questions we all have right. time Thank for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes.